Hello. So, what an honor, man. I tell you, coming to a cowboy church, I've never been to one before. And I had no idea what to expect. But, gosh, you even got a wagon in here. That is really, really cool. And I just hope and pray that I can live up to the, the, the uniqueness of the cowboy church. So maybe <coughs> we can lasso some demons and boot them out. How's that? <laughs> maybe, just maybe, I can stir up you. I don't know. But anyway, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And Mark's been a friend for a long time. And uh, I love the man. He's been a good, good friend in many, many ways and also has been great counsel for me. <coughs> along with Carolyn, and we've enjoyed many things and many, uh, gone through many different trials and tribulations together, and uh, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you something about that meeting he was talking about. Um, when I arrived at that dealership, I've never had a voice like that, but I think when I walked in and he was sitting down and I was standing up and he looked up and he was kind of like, dang, <laughs> you know? And so he said, so you're the bumper man? I said, that's me. And he said, well, let me take you out here and show you what we got. And I said, okay. So we're walking through and we did a little chit chatting. So we're walking through the mechanic shop and there are mechanics on both sides, you know, there's a middle aisle. And we're walking down through there, and he said, you're a Christian, aren't you? And I went, oh, yeah? And I was like, how did he know that? And he said, I could just tell. And I said, okay. And uh, a little more chit-chat. I don't remember exactly what it was about, but he suddenly just said, you don't mind me praying for you, do you? And I said, absolutely not. I'd love it. Well, I thought he was going to wait until we got outside and maybe got over near the truck and hide a little bit. <laughs> but he grabbed my hands right there in that mechanic shop, and he started praying for me right there. And so I had my eyes going like, I was kind of like, and I was looking around to see who was watching. You know, because all these mechanics, they're over there with their wrenches and everything. They're kind of peeking out like, what in the heck are they doing? And it didn't intimidate that man one single bit to pray for me. And ever since then, I've had an a incredible respect for his boldness. And he's been bold ever since, uh, sometimes to the point of embarrassment. But <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> That's okay. Mark, thank you for being such a great friend. Well, we're here uh, because of the book, I guess. Or the Holy Spirit has something else in mind. I don't know what it is exactly. Uh, but I do want to tell you a little bit about the book. Um, maybe it'll give you some inspiration or, or edification. But uh, Beth and I started out in a very awkward way because I was going, when I met Beth, I was going through a divorce and uh, she had been a 15 year drug addict. And man, if I get emotional, y'all, <laughs> I, I tell you, it, it's, it's, I, could, I could read about it, I can hear some other people talk about it, but when I start talking about it, I get crazy, I don't know what the deal is. But anyway, we, she was a, a drug addict for many, many years, and um, uh, we met, and of course, for me, it was just like, uh, she was younger than me, and, and I was living in an apartment complex, and uh, I happened to see her walking her dogs while I was driving out of the apartment complex, so I just uh, slammed on brakes and went, golly. Yeah, you know, she was decked out and looking really, really good. So as time progressed, I found out that she actually worked at the apartment complex. So to make a tremendously long story short, it's all in here, but 
we began to be become friends and later started dating after a couple of years. And, um, but I had never been around a drug addict before. And I just could not believe the weird stuff she was doing. And like, I'd take her out on a date and she'd get a phone call and she'd get up from where we were eating dinner and say, oh, I got a friend picking me up. I'll see you later. And I'm like, what? I say, we're, this, we're on a date. You know that, right? And so, and then there were times when she'd disappear for two or three weeks, and I had no idea where she was, never got a call. But there was a claw in Beth, and it was that claw that the demon of addiction was latching onto her. And I'm telling you right now, that claw is powerful. And I don't know if anybody here has ever experienced that demon but I can tell you this, that demon doesn't want to let go. And he comes in many forms. He comes in the form of, a, of alcohol. He comes in the form of heroin. He comes in the form of coke. He comes in the form of meth. And many other horrible drugs that have been created to bring people like her and people like us down to drive a wedge between us and the Lord Jesus Christ, to keep us from actually being who we need to be in Christ because our minds are open up to the devil. When you have something that's affecting the way you think, that's an open door to the devil. Amen. And we can't have that. And I, I didn't know about all this because I'd never been around a person like that. But as time went on, I figured it out. And with many, many, many painful days and nights, uh, her parents ended up kicking her out because she was living with her parents. And uh, I was a Christian, but I was, I was, single, I was single then. Uh, I was beginning to... Uh, fade away from the Lord because when a man who's been married 18 years gets single, it's kind of like, especially when that marriage was horrible, but it was kind of like I felt this sense of, of uh, freedom, and I kind of resorted back to being a teenager. And uh, thank you. And um, I had some crazy times. But anyway, as, as time went on, uh, I did fall in love with her. I felt like I, f I saw her sober enough times to know that, that she was a tender and precious soul. And um, it just never got any better. All of this is in the book, but I can tell you this, that it wasn't, as, as, a, as, as a man who wants to protect you know, most men want to protect the people they love. I kept saying to myself, if I get right, if I can just get my relationship with the Lord right, I can certainly save her. I mean, I remember saying those words. I can save her. I didn't mean salvation, but I meant I can help her become free from this claw of the devil. And the actual thing that really happened was, I became her biggest enabler. And I gave her a place to sleep. I gave her food. I gave her rest when she needed rest. And guess what all that did? It allowed her to keep doing what she had always done. And so it wasn't until I came to the realization that I cannot enable her and expect her to get better that things started faintly looking better. And to the point where I was, uh, I decided to move to Texas from South Carolina. Because I couldn't, every time she came to my door, the, you know, I loved the girl and I was trying to not enable her, but my heart said, I, I couldn't say no, you know? It was just one of those weaknesses 
I guess that that's in me that I just couldn't say no to a person who I know now is living on the street and and fighting every kind of of uh, evil that's out there in the streets as well as fighting that same old demon. And so I always invited her in and said, come on in, until finally I knew I was in God's way. So, as a result of that, hey Elijah, and as a result of that, I just felt like, uh, man, what can I do, God? What can I do to make this better? And he said, leave. And I, I okay. And so an opportunity arose for me to go to Texas. And uh, I took that opportunity and left Greenville. Now, I was at a point where I was very fragile. I knew I was still in love with her. I knew that my life didn't reflect the most uh, eloquent Christian man, and I hadn't been leading her in Christ's likeness. And uh, I was guilty. I was felt ashamed. But when I got to Texas, things started changing, and I'd made a I made a pact with her dad that we would call each other and pray for one another or pray for her at least once a week. And even if we didn't have uh, a chance to talk, we would leave a, a prayer on each other's phone. And then we would always pray for her. And uh, she was getting worse and worse. Every now and then she'd call my phone and I'd be in Texas and She'd say, hey, and I'd say, well, what are you doing? And she'd, well, I'm, I'm living on the street. I don't have any food. I don't know what to do, and blah, blah, blah. And all I could say was, all I can do for you is pray for you. I didn't have any money. I didn't have anything to send her. And God had me right where he wanted me. So while I was gone, she had a, an event in her life that changed her life because she was basically kidnapped and taken to a house where she was raped all night long. She cried out to the Lord and said, if you'll save me, I'll live for you. If you'll save me, I'll live for you. So the next morning, this guy who could have killed her and nobody would have known the difference because she was dis she disappeared for weeks at a time and nobody knew where she was anyway. So if he had killed her, nobody would have ever known until somebody found the, the body. So he just gets up and says, come on, I'll drop you off. And Beth is just completely dismayed because she thought the guy was going to try to harm her. And he took her down the road and dropped her off. And uh, he said to her when he, she was getting out of the car, well, I guess I'm in trouble now. And, of course, Beth, she, went out, she left the car, went to the hospital, and she got checked out and all that. And they tried to encourage her to call the police, but she had tickets and warrants and I don't know what else. That she said, no police. So anyway, it came to the point where Beth was at her wit's end. And uh, I wish I could tell the whole thing. It's amazing. But I will tell you this, that it wasn't a rehab that changed her. It wasn't narcotics narcotics anonymous that changed her it was god he delivered her overnight because she was willing to cry out in desperateness to say i can't do it any other way she had already done she had already done the rehabs three times and every time returned and started back to doing what she'd done before 
Well, you just can't depend on an organization that says you can pick any God you want, but you just got to have a high power so that you can get off something. You just can't trust that because there's only one higher power. And ask Jesus Christ. And I'll tell you what, when somebody tells me that you can have a different higher power and become successful in what you're trying to do, I just laugh. Because God is a jealous God and he has no other gods before him. None. Including anything that we make up for our own selves. Anyway, <clears throat> I had no idea that I'd get that, that emotional. But you know what? It was a big event. For us, and we ended up getting married, uh, and, and believe me, I'm leaving out tons, but it's right here. I mean, there are so many things. Uh, this, oh yeah, the book does have a little bit about us before we met too, and it shows how God had had His hand on both of us all through our lives, and even though He was saying. No to me many times in the beginning he knew exactly what he was doing because I never thought I'd ever do anything but play professional football and that's what I lived for I slept for I ate for I worked out for and then it just all ended and so I didn't know what to do so all that's in the book too and I'm trying not to tell you everything but um but anyway, let me just give you a little, let me get my glasses here. I left my glasses at home and Beth and, um, I'm sorry, Carolyn. Carolyn had to go to the Wally Mart this morning. So anyway, let me just read you a little bit of the preface and it'll give you a little overview of what's going on. There are a bunch of true stories that God is the same yesterday, today, and yes, forever. It's about a wonderful Savior who was crucified and died for our sins, then rose again on a third day and ascended into heaven. A Savior who loved us so much that he sent his Holy Spirit to help us with everything and to give us spiritual gifts. We just have to be willing and have the faith to use them. I think that one of the things that we're called to do is to educate, educate people about the Holy Spirit and the power that we're supposed to have as Christians is incredible. Quit being a man be pan be Christian. I'm telling you right now, the strength that the Lord can give you will knock you off your feet. And I, you don't have to, be, you don't, like right now, I can't feel my feet. My knees are going out. But I feel stronger than I've ever been in my life because of my relationship with the Lord and the relationship with my lovely wife. But it also is this, uh, we, 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 we know that this Savior is coming soon. We know that the time and date is not for sure. But the fantastic thing is that we can all be a part of it, of what that special event, and uh, then we can li live eternally with our Father in heaven. And when you start reading the book, you will see evidence of how God, in all his sovereignty, will use any situation he wants to. To teach you, to instruct you, to convict you, to edify you, to bless you, to lift you up, to spank you, and correct you. He can show mercy. He can show grace. And he'll show you his boundless, unchanging love. Just like he did. In the, and we wrote about it in this book. All these things, hopefully, will build your faith 
in who God is and who you are in Jesus Christ. Because we're not supposed to sit around and feel defeated, folks. Never. We're supposed to be like Jesus. He's never been defeated. People thought he was. But when you go to the grave and you rise on the third day, that's not defeat. That's victory. That's victory. So I guess there are a lot of people who don't think miracles happen on a daily basis. But I can tell you this. They happen a whole lot more than most people think. As we proceed with the book, you will see how the grace of God is in still full operation to, to, uh, hold on here. to save us from harm, to keep us from mistakes, to teach us, to advance us to a greater level of spirit, spirituality and physically and financially. I can assure you that if you give your heart to Jesus and have faith in his word, you will realize that he is and always will be the way maker. He is a miracle worker. He is a promise keeper. And he always is a light in your darkness. Amen. You got to understand that we are nothing <coughs> but lumps of dried up clay when we're born into a sinful wor world. We have no real revealed godly purpose. <laughs> then the living water, which is Jesus, is rained down in the form of the Holy Spirit. If we allow him, he can turn us into workable clay with the ability to be shaped. By God's grace, he sets up the potter's will. And during this time, he beats us and he needs us in a way where we become pliable. Whoever's been beat and needed, I have. And we think it's a trial, tribulation sometimes that why has this happened to me? Well, let me tell you, when you're in your trials, one of your greatest times to get close to the Lord. And I had to learn that the hard way. I wish everybody could just know that God's there. And when we got things, issues of life right now, so many issues that, uh, let me not get ahead of myself. But anyway, the living water Jesus is rained down from the Holy Spirit. If we allow him, he can turn us into workable clay with the ability to shape us by God's grace. He sets us up on the potter's wheel, and during this time, he beats and needs us in a way where we become pliable. Now, the potter's wheel is turning, and our formation begins when God shapes us into exactly what he wants as long as we stay pliable. How do we do that? Well, we keep adding fresh water of the Holy Spirit. It keeps us pliable. Not allowing that fresh water will cause us to dry out and eventually crumble. As we continue to let that fresh water of the Holy Spirit in, our life begins to take shape. We begin to realize that we are becoming what we are becoming in the hands of of the Almighty God. After many turns around that will and much forming by the hands of God, we become molded into exactly what we are supposed to be and it molded into something that will fulfill our purpose. We are put into a fire. How many are ever put in a fire? Oh my goodness. We're put in a fire and then we become firm and strong. You put clay into a fire and it hardens. You put Christians into a fire and they get stronger. They get harder. They get, they get to where things can't penetrate them. 
because then they're leaning and loving the Lord like they never had before. So, hold on, I'll find it. After many turns around that wheel, in much form and by the hands of God, we become molded into exactly what we're so supposed to be to fulfill our purpose. We become firm and strong in that fire. Now, we are hard to penetrate by the world and by sin. Then comes the glaze that seals us for righteousness. You know what I think the glaze is for a Christian? Other Christians. I think it's the iron that sharpens the iron. It's the church. And I don't mean a building. I mean it's the people in the church that love the Lord with all their heart, all their soul, all their mind. And they come to you in a time of need and show you their love. That's what I think the glaze is. And once you get that glaze on, guess what? You've got to go through the fire again. Because that's what hardens that glaze. And sometimes you might face trials and tribulations that you think you shouldn't face because you do have the glaze. You do have the fellowship with Christians. You do have a, a, new, a new love for the Lord. You do have an excitement about being more like Jesus. But yet here comes that fire again. And you ask yourself, why? Well, that's because he's got the hardened glaze. And between that and being hard, hardened as that clay, we become tougher, stronger. Now we're really hard to penetrate. Another trip around the fire hardens that seal and brings us to a point where we can be placed and used for our divine purpose. In Isaiah 64, 8, it says this, But now, Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay, and you are the potter. And all of us are the work of your hand. Now, I can't describe how awesome the work of his hand has been in, in Beth and mine's, my life. Because we have been around, uh, we have gone around this mountain so many times uh, of, of trying not to change anything. In the early days, we tried just to be the same and do everything the way we always did. How many of you know that if you keep doing the th same thing you've always done, you're going to keep getting what you always got? So you've got to understand, it's time that you make a change. You've got to make a change. You can't come to church and just get fed all the time. Do you realize what happens to the Dead Sea? The Dead Sea has an inlet. And it's fed on a constant basis. But it has no outlet. And the Dead Sea is so nasty you can't drink the water. You can't hardly fish in it because fish can't survive. It doesn't thrive. It just becomes stagnant. Now the Sea of Galilee, on the other hand, it's got inlets and outlets. And it thrives. The fish there are just some awesome. You, can, you, you, have, you have foliage and green all over the side banks of the of Sea of Galilee. Because it's good, fresh water. How does it stay fresh? Because it lets things in, but it also lets things out. As Christians, if we just get fed, we'll become stagnant. But you can't just leave church every Sunday and be who you want to be. you got to leave church and be who Jesus wants you to be. Jesus doesn't, I mean, church doesn't stop on Sunday. It should be with you the whole week. It should be so incredibly exciting that you can't wait to open your Bible and read 
and find out what God has for us all. I mean, it's just crazy. Beth and I have, have come to understand that we often were told things, especially on TV, by TV evangelists, that were absolutely false. And we started reading the Bible on our own. And now, when we hear something that's not right, we can look at each other and say, uh-uh. And I, she's a lot better at uh-uh than I am. And, and she'll look at me and say, that's not right. And sure enough, we'll look it up. And we already have an idea where it is because we've read through the Bible and we're, we're going through it again. And we're, we've become to understand that God's given us another gift. And that gift is discernment. And we're beginning to discern exactly what God wants us to do with our own life. Now, we're at a point where we still don't know what God's plan is for us. But we do know this, that whatever it is, we're going to put him first. Amen. We're going to keep reading his word. We're going to keep being excited to hear from him every morning. There's an old song that says, I wake up shaking every morning at dawn. I just got to have some more of what I've been on. It's on the nightstand. I keep it real close. I grab the word of God and I take a double dose. And that's the way it should be for all of us. For all of us. And I know that sometimes we feel that our zeal is at a point where we can't do things for people. We can we see oh my gosh, we were we were driving down the streets of Albuquerque. Let me tell you, that's an experience. That is an experience I have never in my life uh, seen so many homeless, and I don't know how to say it nicely, but women of the evening. We have seen people walking down the street yelling and cussing at nobody. They're just out there. And you're looking around. There's nobody there. Well, there is something there. These people have let in demonic influence in their life to the point where they walk with demons. They talk with demons. And they do what the demons control them to do. They no longer have control of their life because they've given their life over to something that's evil. Something that could take them down the wrong road. Something that can lie to them. Something that can mislead them. Something that can make them sad and depressed and oppressed. Something that can make... I mean, don't, don't be fooled. Even Christians, even people right now are dealing with things that are causing them to feel less than worthy. Amen. People here today are, are dealing with things that's causing them to feel like they could never tell anybody else about Jesus. They'd rather just sit still, go home, and, and, and go around the same mountain. It's time not to be going around the same mountain. Because you go around that same mountain, you dig a rut. And if you keep going and you keep going, that rut gets deeper and deeper and deeper. And you begin to sink. And then you get to the point where if you want out, you're going to have to get a mighty strong ladder to get you back where you were before. Our Christian life is designed to where we should be moving to a different level. Every time we learn, every time we hear something new about the way Jesus Christ uh, infiltrates our life, the way he gives us strength, the way he gives us power, the way he gives us a, a newness, a freshness. You know, I just, I just can't tell you what God has done for us has blown me away and made me a man that I never thought I'd be. 
And that doesn't mean I'm bragging on myself. It just means that I never thought I'd, I'd wake up every morning and the first thing on my mind would be Jesus. You know? And it's kind of kind of cool. I never thought I'd be married to a woman who, if she doesn't have her God time in the morning, she is not the same person. I mean, it's kind of like, if she doesn't have God time, it's kind of like a woman on menopause. That's the way it is, you know? I hate to be that way, but it is. It's just, she's just as irritable as an old goose, you know? They want to peck on you and, and bite you and not everything else. So the God time has been so, come, become so important to her that uh, it's the first thing. She gets up before me. And we kind of do it that way on purpose so she can have her alone time. And then I get up and sometimes I don't even get to read the Bible because she's already so much in it. She's telling me, oh, guess what I read today? Guess what I saw today? Let me read it to you. I'm going to go back over it. And I said, okay, go ahead. Well, let me tell you something, folks. I don't care if I'm reading it or I'm hearing it. It's still the Word of God. So and when she reads it to me, faith comes by hearing. And hearing by the word of God. So I say all that to say this to encourage you guys that, you know, a lot of times we get into place where we just, a church is just a social event. You know, a church is just where you come to hang out with your friends and not get built up in the Lord Jesus Christ. Shouldn't be that way. Yes, you should have friends. Yes, you should. Love them. I love the people who I've been to church with. They're my family. I mean, they're closer than my brothers. And I just love them so much because how they edify me. But at the same time, a lot of times we get so complacent with coming to church. It's just something we do. It, it's a good habit. But if that's all it is, is a habit, then you're using it for the wrong reason. And if you, if you leave here challenged, which you should be, you should, you should challenge yourself. I'm telling you, if you have a pastor that doesn't challenge you, you need to challenge yourself every Sunday. Right, Mark? Absolutely. Right? Because you need to challenge yourself to go out there and do something different that you haven't done, to step out of your comfort zone, to be somebody you've never been before. Knowing that, you can have that strength from the Lord. And I'm just going to end this with, uh, I've always wanted to say this. I'm just going to land this plane. <laughs> I hear people say that all the time. I thought, I But I'm just going to land this plane by reading you 20 cans. Cans, C-A-N-S, cans for success. Why? Should we say, I can't, when the Bible says that I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength in Philippians 4.13? Why should I live in poverty when I know that God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus? Philippians 4.13. Why should I fear? When the Bible says God has not given me a spirit of fear, but a power, love, and sound mind. In 2 Timothy 1, 7. Why should I have a lack of faith to fulfill my calling when I know that God has given me the measure of faith that I need already? Romans 12, 3. Why should I be weak when the Bible says that the Lord is the strength of my life and I will display strength and take action because I know God? Psalms 27, Daniel 11. Why should I allow Satan authority over my life? Drugs, alcohol, pornography. When I know that greater is he who's in me than he that's in the world. 1 John 4, 4. 
Why should I accept defeat when the Bible says that God will always lead me in triumph? 2 Corinthians 2.14 Why should I lack wisdom when Christ became wisdom for me and says when we ask for it, he will give it to us abundantly. Why should I feel depressed? Why should you feel depressed? When I can call to, call to mind God's loving kindness every single day, his compassion, his faithfulness, and have hope. Why should I worry or fret when I can cast all my anxiety on Christ who cares for me? 1 Peter 5, 7. Why should I ever be in bondage knowing that where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. That's how my wife got free. By the Spirit of the Lord. No other way. Nothing ever worked until she said, Lord, take me, show me, heal me, make me who you want me to be. And he did that very thing. How many knows that when you ask God for bread, he doesn't give you a scorpion? I mean, the Bible says if you're a father, you know how to give good gifts. How much better does God himself give? You've got to keep that in mind. Why should I feel condemned when the Bible says I am not condemned because I am in Christ? Romans 8, 1. Why should I feel alone when Jesus said he is with me always and he will never leave me or forsake me? Matthew 28, 20. Hebrews 13, 5. Why should I feel cursed or the victim of a of bad luck when the Bible says that Jesus saved me from the curse of the law so that I might receive his spirit. Galatians 3, 13 and 14. Why should I be discontented when I, like, when I, like Paul, can learn to be content in all my circumstances? That doesn't mean be content in your walk with the Lord. Because you ought to be striving every single day to make that more powerful. But we all have circumstances. We all have situations where we feel like, woe is me, look at poor me. I, got, I can't do this, I can't do that. I don't have this, I don't have that. Well, be content. You'd be surprised how much your joy in the Lord can activate his grace and mercy. Amen. Why should I be discontented when I like... Okay, I said that one. Why should I feel worthless when Christ became sin on my behalf that I might become the righteousness of, of God in him? 2 Corinthians 5.21 Why should I have a, a persecution complex knowing that nobody can be against me if God is for me. Amen. Romans 8.31 Why should I be confused when God is the author of peace and he gives me knowledge through his spirit in me? 1 Corinthians 14.33 1 Corinthians 2.12 Why should I feel like a failure when I am a conqueror in all things through Christ? Romans 8, 37. Why should I let the pressure of this world overwhelm me when I know that Jesus has overcome the world and its tribulations and its trials and its evil and its temptations? He's overcome all of it. He took it all on the cross. He died for you. He loves you. He wants you to be well. 
He wants you to be prosperous. He wants you to be delivered from these demons that have been attacking you. You might not be possessed, but I'm telling you right now, a demon can oppress you. And you've got to know when they're coming in the door every day, coming after you. Guess what? You've got authority in the name of Jesus to cast down those demons. And I'm telling you right now, I've had to cast down many, many in our walk with the Lord. In here, you'll, you'll see a couple examples of those that are pretty freaky, but it is absolutely changed my life when I started listening to the power that Christians are supposed to have when they walk with the Lord. Now, what can, what can break away prayer? Well, disobedience. You know, sometimes we say, well, my prayer never works. Why, are you being obedient? Are you doing what God said to do? You know, the Bible's full of, if you, then I. But most people don't preach the if you's. They just preach the good thing that's going to happen. And, and, and they leave, it, leave out what you got to do to get that good thing to happen. I wish, I, you know, I might write a book on if yous. <laughs> I, think, I think Christians need to know about the if yous. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I, I just, I just want to encourage you, though. I always like to, I want to challenge you. I want you to go out here and uh, go out here today knowing that it's not your responsibility to just leave and sit on your butt all week. I mean, and I mean it in the nicest way. Because <laughs> I like to do that every now and then too. But we got a responsibility as Christians. How many times? Oh my goodness, we got out of the car the other day and... and uh, the Lord showed Beth some things, and I didn't see them. But as a matter of fact, we were with Mark, and he was kind enough to buy me some shoes because I was starting to wobble. You know, we bulls wobble, but we don't fall down. <laughs> uh, and um, the thing about it was she got out of the car, and there were two people, and they were yelling and screaming at the air not at each other they were just looking around arr, 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 and using profanity and she came into the store did you see those people Kenny and I was kind of I was excited about my shoes and I said uh, no uh, I didn't see them and so I just kind of forgot about it well she didn't she she actually kept going back to the window to make sure they weren't breaking into our truck but overnight, the Lord dealt with her. And the Lord said to her that, are you just going to look at those people like that? Did you even take time to say a word of encouragement to them? Did you even take time to pray for them? To ask God, to bless them and deliver them from these demons that are causing them to go out there and curse at the world. To, to Their only goal in life is to get more drugs. They could care less about food. They, you give them money, they go get drugs. It will kill them. And so that following morning, Beth came to me and she was in tears. And she said, Kenny, I, I just... I just think we did the wrong thing. And I said, well, honey, I didn't really see him, so you did the wrong thing. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously. I said, well, tell me about it. And she told me, yeah, I should have, I should have, you know, at least said a prayer for him. It's like the Good Samaritan. And uh, I'm going to read that to you. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among the robbers, and they stripped him and beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. And by chance, a priest was going down on the road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. A priest! 
Likewise, a Levite also, when he came to the place and saw him pass by on the other side. Who were Levites? Those are the God-assigned holy people, the Levites. But a Samaritan who was on a journey came up upon him, and when he saw him, he felt compassion. And he came to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring oil and wine on them. And he put him on his own beast, put him in his own car, and brought him to an inn to take care of him. Took him to a hospital so he could be taken care of. On the next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, innkeeper and said, Take care of him. And whatever more you spend, when I return, I will repay you. Which of these three men, the priest, the Levite, or the Samaritan, do y'all think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the robber's hands? He was the Samaritan. And God says in his commandments to love your neighbor as yourself. So what are we going to do with that? We're just going to look at people and walk away. We're going to see hungry people and just say, I'm sorry, you're hungry. I'll pray for you. I'm sorry, you're thirsty. I'll pray for you. I'm sorry you don't have any shoes on your feet. But I'll pray for you. There are times when we have to be doers of the word, not just hearers of the word. So I'm just saying with all my heart and all my soul that when you love Jesus, there's more to it than just going to church you know there's more to it it doesn't end here on Sunday afternoon and we all go to the buff bay you know it ends when we all see Jesus again but while we're here we got to be about his business and that's what he assigned his disciples to do and we're supposed to be his disciples now we're actually part of the Jewish world now because we've been adopted into the kingdom of Abraham. The promise of Abraham was that, you know, the Israelites would be his children. They'd be the chosen generation. Well, guess what? Through adoption, every Christian is just that. We all have the inheritance of God. You know? Isn't that cool? Man, I'm just loving it. Now, I know I know right now that when I die, don't, if I die, don't be sad. Because I'm telling you right now, I'm going to be somewhere where I am celebrating, dancing, singing, shouting, and loving the Lord. And I, I believe that with all my heart. And God, I don't want to die. I'm just, just saying. <laughs> so... I think that's all I got, but I do want to encourage y'all to, first and foremost, read your Bible on a daily basis. Start from Genesis and read it all the way through. And I'm telling you, the more you read it, the more you're going to get it. The more you read it, the more you're going to understand it. And it would be very, very beneficial if every time you open it up, you say, Holy Ghost, tell me exactly what you want to tell me today. Show me exactly what you want me to see. Help me to understand why I'm reading what I'm reading. Help me to know you better. Help me to love you more. Help me to be your child. Help me to do your will. And guess what? Remember the verse back there when I said, you know, he ain't going to give you no serpent when you ask for bread. He knows how to give good gifts. And if you ask something in his will, he'll do just that. That's it.
Thank you. <laughs>